I'll tell you two stories and you tell me what they have in common. All right. So they're, they're both true stories. So story number one goes like this. Uh, this was a couple of years ago. I was actually in the mall with my wife and I didn't need anything at all. I was just in there keeping her company. And while she was shopping, I was killing time. I walked into this fit to run store. And again, I didn't need anything. So if the store associate came up to me, Will, and said, how can I help you? What do you think I would have said? Uh, probably the same thing as me or any, anyone else. Um, I, I'm just browsing, so I'm fine. Just, just browsing. If she said, uh, what brings you in today? What do you think I would have said? Um, just browsing. Just probably. browsing. Yeah. I should. So she didn't do any of those things. She looked down at my sneakers. She said, are you a runner? I said, yes. She said, what distance? I said, I'm training for a marathon. And then she said, have you ever had a running gait test? And I said, what's that? And moments later, I'm on a treadmill in the store. I actually have a recording of this. She freezes the video frame and she says this, Josh, you notice how your feet are over pronating when you run? I was like, oh yeah, I could see that. And she goes, and did you know that if you run in sneakers that are not made for pronated feet, you can get injured on long distance runs and get sidelined. If you'd like, I could take a look at your sneakers to see if they're made for pronated feet. And about four minutes later, I'm spending 180 fucking dollars on new sneakers and insoles. <laughs> So that's, that's story number one. Um, story number two goes like this. Again, true story. I love washing my car on the weekends. I use a bucket and a sponge and suds like probably most of you listening. I didn't have a problem with my bucket and suds and sponge until I got this email from this company called Adams Car Wash Supply. And the sentence said this, Josh, how do you know your car wash mitt won't scratch your car? That kind of stopped me in my tracks because I was thinking to myself, well, what do you mean? What's this talking about? I wasn't sure. It was a question that was difficult to answer. So it turns out that if you wash your car with a normal bucket and sponge, dirt can get on the sponge. That's a problem because if you're a car nut like me and you have a dark colored car, you get these swirl marks on the hood. And that's about $800 to get taken care of, not to mention the residual value of the car depreciates when you sell it because when you get it repainted, they run a paint thin meter over the hood. They could tell it's been repainted. It's worth less money. And Adam sells this new kind of bucket. It's got a grate on the bottom of it. You rub your sponge on the grate and the dirt settles to the bottom of the bucket and off your car. And I bought it. It's called a grit guard. So, Will, back to you. Um, what do those two stories have in common? Um, they both caused you to really, to really think about the problem that you didn't know was there. That's exactly it. Right. So everybody that you reach out to is washing their car with a bucket. Everybody that you reach out to is running in their sneakers. So in order for you to get someone's attention and interest and to be a red X, you have to know something that they don't know that can cause them a potential future disaster. So in the case of the car example, what was the future disaster that this message illuminated? It's a big loss of money when you go to sell your car, damage to the car, probably eventual hurt, sadness. All the rest. Yeah, scratch, 800 dollars What about in the running example? What was the future disaster that it shined a light on in that example? Um, probably damage to your feet. If your shoes don't fit properly, your inability to run um, as you get older and stop, stop doing something that you love and enjoy. Yeah, and, and you, maybe you get sidelined um, for the race, right? So all these problems that you shine a light on, they all have implications. I call it, you know, making the problem bleed a little bit, right? Like the problem with getting sponge dirt on the sponge, that's the problem. The problem with that, the impact of that is it scratches a car, 800 bucks, cars in the shop, paint thin meter, cars worth less money. And then personally, it might bother you that your car has been repainted. Same thing with the running example. The problem is you're running in sneakers that might not be for your feet, you can get injured. And the reason that's a problem, the implication of it, twisting the knife, is you get sidelined. And you feel bad that you couldn't finish the race that you trained for for six months. So all these problems have like emotional, personal reasons and also business reasons. And the job of a salesperson is to have a hypothesis as to what the prospect doesn't know that you know. And then you ask a question, like we just demonstrated, that essentially pokes the bear. Um, it's a metaphor for asking someone a question that's a little difficult to answer. And what typically happens is people say, well, what do you mean? And then they're kind of leaning forward. Um, so having that as a perspective is a crucial first step in doing outreach. Because if you're talking about better buckets, 
and you're talking about better sneakers, the answer you're going to get most of the time is I got a vendor for that. I got that covered because they do. So it's not really about a value proposition. It's about trying to identify what is it the problem that they might not know they had that can hurt them. And how can we ask that in a way that's going to get them to scratch their head and say, what do you mean? I'm not sure. It's that illuminating question, isn't it? Something that really illuminates the pain that they've got that they weren't aware of as well. Yeah. It brings it to their attention. Yeah, back in the uh, 30s, this, the, the copywriter's name is eluding me right now. I think it was Elm or something, but it, he had a great ad. It said, um, um, how do you know your oil is topped off? How do, you, how do you know your oil is at the proper level? This was back before they had dipsticks and ways to measure stuff you know, electronically. And that one sentence... Um, I think it was like for Texaco, 250,000 more people got oil changes because they were like, I don't know. And if I don't have, if my, if my oil is not at the proper level, I could get, mess up my engine and damage my car. It, it kind of makes someone scratch their head and think, hmm, I'm not sure. And people love to find out the answer to stuff. Most people are really, really curious to sort of solve these things. Yeah, that's um, that's an interesting thing that you brought up. Like if you've ever watched a, TV series on Netflix. What happens in the last like 10 seconds always? What do they do to you? Uh, the hook, the cliffhanger. They get you excited <laughs> for the next episode. Yeah. That, so it's, a, it's what's called a, um, an information gap coined by uh, George Lowenstein out of Carnegie Mellon. And it's this idea that brains crave closure between what they know and what they don't know. I was watching my wife yesterday with a, with a puzzle, jigsaw puzzle. And she kept going back to it and going back to it and going back to it because she had to finish it. There was like 15 pieces left. So that's the brain. And it's the same thing with cold calling. It's the same thing with cold emailing. How can you apply these principles of how people are wired to the cold calling to the email to make people a little curious? Same exact way as TV series do on, on Netflix. Yeah, I think that's got to be probably one of the best ways that you can get someone to engage with you over email as well as that information gap. It's so easy to ignore someone over email it's a little bit harder on the phone um obviously you're going to get some people hang up and we'll move on to that in a bit but that's definitely sort of one of the key hooks to get someone excited and get someone to respond i'm sure yeah i've been ignored plenty of times on the cold call i mean if you're if you're not interesting if you don't have a perspective um and you're hearing i'm not interested far too many times that means you're not interesting meaning you don't have a perspective on what it is that you know that your prospect doesn't know that can hurt them and so from their perspective you're like i'm doing that already I got that already. You're not really meaningfully different. And so that's where a lot of the crux of the problem comes when you're cold calling and, and cold emailing is that prospects are saying to themselves, I got sneakers. I don't need faster sneakers. My sneakers are fine. They're good enough. You got the good enough syndrome. Like most of the time when you're reaching out to people, things are good enough. Like all the TVs on the market right now, every TV, they're good enough. Like they're great. Not a great picture. Whether you buy this one or that one, you hang it up on the wall, it's it's great. And that's the same kind of thing with your prospect. Like they have something that's probably good enough. So what is it that you don't know that can hurt them bad um, around the corner? Because if you don't have that perspective and you don't clearly see how they're getting the job done today, you're going to be grouped into, I got that already. I'm not interested. Rightfully so. Got a TV already. I mean, I'll tell you just another, another story because this is just fresh in my mind. This is like, like a couple weeks ago. Um, I wanted to buy an expensive road bike. I'm into biking. And I decided to call three shops. I wanted this bike called a Pinarello Dogma F12 disc brake bike. Code, code for all you bikers out there that are listening. And I called the first two shops. And they said I had a couple of them in my side and size and come over and you know take a look at them. I called the third bike shop. said, hey, I'm looking for a Dogma Pinarello F12 disc brake you know, like a 52 or 53. And the owner, his name was John at Racer's Edge, he said this, we don't sell bikes that way. Now, this is an expensive bike. It's a $13,000 bike. And he's like, we don't sell bikes that way. And I, I said, what do you mean? He goes, well, the problem with going into a store and buying an expensive bike is that although it'll feel comfortable when you're riding around in a parking lot, when you're taking on a 30 or 40 mile ride, you'll realize that you are hurting a little bit because it doesn't fit you right. And a lot of these bikes can't be adjusted to actually fit you. So you end up selling the bike and you lose about 50% of what you paid for it. So what we do is we fit you first and then we match to a bike. 
We've done more fittings in South Florida than any other company. We have 10,000 under our belt. And so if you'd like to learn more about that, we can talk. But if you're looking for a bike, we're not the right bike shop for you. That's a point of view. And I went in there and bought a bike from the guy. His name is John, right? I ended up getting a specialized bike, a completely different bike than what I wanted, but one that fit me. It was a two hour process. And again, the lesson here is he's the red X, right? Like he has a perspective and a point of view. And this is all over the place. Like I had a TV hung, TV hung story. Like just literally yesterday, I was on a site called um, TaskRabbit, which is a site where you can hire handymen. Well, unless you're willing, you don't need a site like this. Now, you hire handymen. And I noticed people hanging TVs charge anywhere from 25 bucks to $46. I'm like, that's weird. Like why are some people 25, why 46? So I called Tim, chatted him up. I'm like, Tim, you're 46 bucks. Why are you more money than all these other people? He goes, well, for three or four reasons. One, um, a lot of times when people go to hang a TV, they don't have the right parts. Sometimes you need special screws depending on the brackets and the configuration of your wall. I carry every single part in my car, so I'm not going to charge you to run to Home Depot and back. Number two is that because I've hung 350 TVs just in the last six months, um, I'm really fast. And so most people will take a couple hours to hang a TV. Um, I can usually do it in under an hour. Three, most of the work I do is fixing TV problems that other people hung because they didn't have the experience. They were kind of crooked, <laughs> right? And so again, he's like, you're penalizing me for being good. That's a perspective. And I hired him. And sure enough, he came and TV was hung, you know, awesome, right? But the point here is, is that the point is to have a point of view. To stand out, you have to stand for something. Yeah, I'm, pro I'm probably the guy that hangs their TV a little bit crooked and says, no, nah, that's good enough. <laughs> right. But, uh, exactly. And it, it just goes, you don't have to be the cheapest in the market just to just to sell what you're trying to sell. You have to have like real vision and you have to have compelling reasons and tell that good story um, as well. We touched on it a minute ago as well. And it's about sort of keeping people um, on the phone, obviously that that guy when you called the bike shop, he he could he kept you on the phone. He could have just said, "Yeah, we have this one. It's this much. Come down and come down this time. We're open these times." Instead, that guy hooked you to stay on the phone. Uh, and one of the questions from our SDRs was, "How how how should they keep prospects on the phone? What's some of the best ways to get people to engage with you and to stop you getting hung up on?" As you said, <laughs> we have all had it. So I don't like that question for a couple of reasons, because it's what the SDR wants, which is how do I get people to stay on the phone with me so that I can book a meeting and so that I can make money. And oddly enough, when your intent is to assume that everybody that you call is a fit for what you're selling and is going to drop everything what they do and, and book a meeting with you, you end up sounding and saying things that come across as salesy, manipulative, and gross. I'll, I'll prove it to you, right? If you've ever been in the mall and you're just minding your own business and one of those aggressive mall kiosk people says, can I ask you a question? What do you do? You just say no, obviously. <laughs> Why? I'm busy. Why? Can't really be bothered. What are you yeah, afraid you... of? What are you afraid is going to happen? Well, you know they're trying to sell something, isn't it? You know you're yeah. probably going to... You're probably going to be hooked. Yeah, they're, they're attached to the outcome of getting a sale, right? So when your intent is to book a meeting, you end up saying things and behaving in ways that feel to the prospect like you feel when the mall kiosk person is saying, can I ask you a question? So step number one in this process of reaching out to people is to actually make a two millimeter shift and to shift away from assuming that everybody that you call needs what you have. Instead, to detach from the outcome and to let go of assumptions and to create an environment where prospects just feel comfortable telling you the truth, which is, yes, they'd like to share a little bit more and continue the conversation, or no, they don't at this time, and either way, you're okay. And it's almost like you're a little indifferent to whatever happens on the call. And when you do that, coincidentally and ironically, um, you feel and sound less salesy and manipulative, which is more inviting to people. And so they open up a little bit more and they're more motivated to listen to what it is that you have to say. 
not as a tactic to get what you want, but just as a mindset and a philosophy of detaching. You know, Jerry, Jerry Steinfeld had this bit that I share when I did these workshops. It's like a 45 second clip where he's in a diner with this girl and the girl, he, they've been dating for a while. And the girl says, Jerry, I've got something to discuss with you. It's probably going to hurt your feelings. And Seinfeld's like, okay, yeah, sure. What is it? Like nonchalantly shrunk in his coffee. He goes, this isn't going to work out with us. And he goes, oh, it's okay. Fine. No problem. Everything's going to be fine with me. I'll get, I'll be, I'll be okay. It's been nice knowing you. And then he goes, sing zippity doo dah as he kind of walks out the door. <laughs> and she's kind of shocked, like, of his reaction that he, she thought he was going to be distraught and all broken up about it, but he was like detached because in prospecting, it's the same way. It's about conversations with an S, not a conversation. And so when your intent and your mindset is every conversation is a meeting, that's when you set forth this behavior that is really off-putting to prospects. So it's not about what you getting people to stay on the phone. Prospects don't want you to get them to stay on the phone. They want you to help them avoid a future disaster. So it starts with that. It starts with you having a perspective and understanding the black and white version of the infomercial that your prospect is in. There that person is in the kitchen trying to make french fries with a knife. They make them three or four times a week. And they're slicing the potatoes into half inch pieces. Some are big, some are small. They cut their fingers sometimes. But that's just how they know how to make the fries. They serve them half and end up in the garbage can because they're not like cooked that well. And then it's an hour and a half to clean up the kitchen. When I was telling that story, you probably visually saw that in your head. And I would ask people that are listening, can you see that black and white version in your head of your prospect? If not, you got to get to know your prospect's job better before you pick up the phone. 